Welcome to USA Football's Coach and Coordinator Podcast, where top football coaches from around the country share their stories, philosophies, concepts, and strategies to help you get better on and off the field. Now, here's your host, Keith Grabowski. Hey, coaches, before we get going today, I just wanted to thank you for all you've been doing to support this podcast. And we have an incredible lineup coming up here. We have just about every major college conference represented. We have a ton of FBS coaches, Division II coaches, Division III coaches, some great high school fo- football coaches coming on the podcast to share with you and help you grow professionally during this time. I really appreciate all of you asking your questions on Twitter. Please follow me at Coach K Grabowski for our daily updates on our guests and your opportunity to ask questions. We will read them on the show and attribute those to you. Um, so please contribute to the show as much as you can. I also want to talk to you a little bit about our football development model, which is something we've rolled out here at USA Football. And this is really for you to uh, be able to help your youth football programs develop. It's about a long-term athlete development plan, something that comes off of the American development model, which is something that the USOC has put together. The idea is that we're able to teach skills in a progression starting at the youngest ages. We're also looking at the different game types we have, whether that's flag, which is non-contact, limited contact games like padded flag or tackle bar, and full contact, and the right progressions for contact teaching there as well. Be sure to check out all we do at footballdevelopment.com and check out what we're doing with the FDM, the football development model at usafootball.com backslash fdm.usafootball.com. Welcome to the Coaching Coordinator Podcast. I'm joined by the former offensive coordinator, quarterbacks coach at the University of Northern Iowa, John Bond. And Coach Bond has joined us before on the podcast. Last time was in 2018 when the Panthers led the FCS in red zone offense. And Coach has always done a great job there at UNI and for you know, some family reasons has stepped aside from the game but still stays close to the game and going to share with us today his thoughts on developing a quarterback. And, and when we finish, we'll share the information again. But he does have a, a book that he's put out uh, some time ago called Developing a Championship Quarterback. So welcome to the show again, Coach. And it's great to have you here. Yeah, I appreciate you having me. I was surprised you asked, but I know it's a good thing you're doing. A lot of these guys are probably pulling their hair out right now. <laughs> yeah, I think everybody's looking for some things to do. And our objective is just to help guys, help the profession grow and get better during this time we have off. I guess make an opportunity out of it. Yep, yep, that's good. That's good. That's what that's what the good ones do. Well, Coach, let's get right into it and talk about, you know, developing a championship quarterback. And like I said, you put together that book. So, you know, when you're looking at that process, I guess what are the the main things that you're going to focus on? And we could dig into some of those. You know, I think the biggest thing, you know, I've coached, I've been a coordinator at a lot of different places, and, and, and actually since 1997, and coached quarterback since 1991, and so I've dealt with a lot of those guys, and I think the number one thing that you've got to do as a quarterback coach is you've got to develop a relationship with the guy. That's the number one by far, you know, it's a people-oriented business, you've got to develop a relationship with that guy. You know, develop some rapport and get where there's a trust factor in there. So, you know, he will allow you in and let you coach him. He's got to, you know, know that you have his best interest at heart, that you're going to tell him the truth. And it may be some hard truth, but you're always going to shoot straight with him and tell him the truth. So to me, that's by far the, the, the number one thing that you've got to do is you've got to have a relationship. And then w- once that happens and once, you do that then then you've got a guy that that, that is going to allow you to mold him a little bit and, and, and help get him to to be the kind of quarterback that you know that he wants to be and that you want him to be and and within that developing the relationship you've got to you've got to give the guy confidence you know once that it's hard to be good at anything if you don't have any confidence and so many quarterbacks that are struggling you know it's not necessarily mechanical issues possibly it could be a confidence factor and that's those are you know you've got to have a relationship and you've got to develop that guy's confidence even if it's a false confidence you know even if he's maybe not as good as he thinks he is that's not necessarily 
bad either, but he, you know, he's got to, he's got to believe in himself and it's, it's hard to believe in yourself when you're getting screamed at for two and a half hours. And, you know, I never was a big screamer and yeller at guys. I, 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 you know, if they did something wrong, I tried to, you know, not go crazy. And if, if they did something well, I wanted everybody to hear it, you know, brag on them and all that. Cause I wanted their teammates to have confidence in them as well. I agree. Couldn't agree with you more. Really, any position. That relationship is the most important part. And it really, you know, you're not going to get much done without that. You will, you'll you only be able to take a guy so far if if that guy doesn't trust you. And so we start with that. But moving on from, from the relationship, Coach, what are you looking at uh, after that? Well, there's I'll tell you what, there's two or three things I'm not looking at. And number one, I'm not looking at height. The best quarterback I ever coached was 5'10". He just retired from the CFL, Kevin Glenn. He threw for 56,000 yards. I think he was like the fifth. He threw for like the fifth most yards in the history of the CFL. He was 5'10". And, you know, from he, he, he taught me a long time ago that that height is a big misconception, kind of like Drew Brees is, is still p- teaching people today. You don't have to be 6'4 and have a rocket arm to be a quarterback. You can, if if you're a littler guy, that so much so much of being a good quarterback is being savvy and being able to move around and get yourself where you can see. And whether whether you're six two or six four, those guys you're throwing over, you know, you're not throwing over those guys who are six six and six seven. You know, the guys coming after you and the guys protecting you. So that that's about as big a misnomer as as, as I can think of. Uh, that the big arm, you know, having a strong arm is really overrated. You know, back when I was a, a little kid, Fran Tarkenton, who was a Minnesota Vikings quarterback and threw for a million yards until Brett Favre or whoever it was broke his, his yardage record. It, the farthest he could throw the ball was 53 yards. So having a big arm is, is way overrated. Being accurate is, is 10 times more important, a million times more important than having a big arm. And and speed, you don't have to be fast. You, know, you just got to have some nice feet and be able to move around and get yourself out of trouble and if you run you don't have to you know be Usain Bolt you just you know go get to the sticks and get down or whatever but there's been a lot of guys who have played a long time who who haven't been very tall or had a strong arm or or been very fast there's a lot of a lot of things that that are way more important you know toughness can can he handle the position both uh, physically and mentally you know you got to be able to step in there when you see a guy coming and, and take the shot right in the mouth and and be able to get up and go again and you know, toughness also means you know can I handle the pressure of the position you know can I can I stand the criticism of the media can I stand the criticism of my teammates from my friends all the things that go into to being a quarterback you know you got that you've got to be able to weather those kinds of storms and, and not worry about all the extracurriculars are going around, you know, are you tough enough to be able to lock in on a daily basis to get better? Because you know what, once you come to the meeting, once you come to the meeting room and then out of practice, you can be one of the guys up until then, but you can't be one of the boys when you step in that film room or you step on the field, it's got to be all business. So, you know, am I able, am I able to, am I competitive? He, he, your guy that's a quarterback should be the most competitive guy on the field, whether it's horse or horseshoes or ping pong or, Scrabble or whatever you're playing, I've never been around a great one who didn't want to beat your butt in, in all of it. So, you know, how how competitive is he? And, then, you know, the third thing is a great leader, especially when all these spread offenses and, all you know, with the quarterback completely running all aspects of the show, you, you, you've got to have a great leader. And it helps if he's a vocal leader. But, you know, guys, a guy that uh, guys rally around and, and respect and, and he's not afraid to, take charge that is huge as far as being a good quarterback and and lastly i mentioned it if i would almost put this as the number one attribute if you were in a pro style offense if you were still in an old-timey pro style offense is you've got to be accurate and, and some of these spread offenses guys probably don't have to be quite as accurate because they can rely on other things and, and still be able to make first downs and score points but Man, if you're in a pro style offense, you better be accurate because if you're kind of, if you're not an accurate passer, you don't have a passing game. So that's why those, you know, those guys, the big guys that have the cannon arms and all that, and, and they have all the near misses that they have and the highs and lows and wides and ups and downs. 
all that is is second and ten. You know, your second and ten or your punt. But those those near misses don't count. It's the guys who can throw strikes and, and, and who are accurate, who are the guys that, that uh, make first downs and score points. You know, Coach, you, you bring up the measurables there, and I thought it was kind of funny. I was thinking, too, just a, a, you know, a couple of weeks ago here with Joe Burrow being measured at the combine, and, and his hand size came up. And he, he was pretty creative with how he handled that on social media. But, you know, again, you, you look at some of those things and maybe, you know, sitting down and talking to, to uh, some of those coaches that week, the NFL coaches around the combine, like – I think we make a, a big deal out of those things, maybe more in the media than, than the coaches will lead on to that, you know, scouts look at it and front offices look at it and all those things, but boils down to at, at the end of the day, can that guy play? Yeah, Joe Burrow maybe has smaller hands from the prototypical quarterback, but I'm pretty sure everybody would want Joe Burrow on their team. Yeah, it's just you know what it's really ridiculous. I'm I'm getting to the point now. I'm I guess I'm probably I'm going to be called boomer here if I'm not already real soon. But there's some things that are just ridiculous to me, and 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 that's one of them. Just you know, hand size. Watch the tape. I, I think his hands were plenty capable of of of, hand, of handling the challenge. You know, and, you know what whether it's hand size. Russell Wilson, how tall is he? Drew Brees, how tall is he? I mean, it's just you know the the, the list is endless. So, these guys put these labels and, and restrictions and, and all that on these guys, and it's just silly, man. you got to believe what you see. I heard that a long time ago. Watch the tape, believe what you see, and uh, if the guy can play, can play. It doesn't matter how tall he is. It doesn't matter his hand size. Or, you know, it's, it's, there's some things that are pretty silly out there to me. Well, Coach, getting into, uh, you know, kind of some of the progression you use here to, to coach your quarterbacks – how do you go about doing that? You get a guy in, certainly you've recruited him, you built that relationship, you're building that trust, but now you get him on the field. What do you like to start with? What are the things, you know, in a day one of having a, a freshman on the field that you're going to start looking at and working with him on? Well, that's a great question. And and I tell you, I, I am, I'm not a guy that believes in a lot of drills. I think, I think we got a lot of, quarterback tutors out there that get on the internet and try to come up with drills that have zero application to the game and it drives me crazy that's another boomer ism right there it drives me nuts i feel like the quarterback position may be the most poorly coached position in all of football because you've got these guys who a lot of them have never played the position and they do all these drills and take a and man the drills look great you know they're running over dummies and they're running cones and they're doing this and they're doing that and it has zero application to the game you know the guys running over dummies I, i've been coaching quarterbacks since 1991 and not one time in a football game have i ever had a quarterback step over a body in the pocket not one time so, you know, I'm saying, well, why are we doing this drill if it never happens in a million years? It's, it's just so ridiculous to me. And, you, you know, you guys run around chasing guys with brooms and doing this and doing that. It's just it's unbelievable some of these quarterback tutors that are making all this money and people invest all this money in these guys that never played, never coached it. They, you know, they see something on the Internet, and now, now they're, the, you know, they're, they're making a bazillion dollars teaching all these kids all over America that, you know, and they're teaching them stuff that don't even apply to what happens in a football game. It drives me crazy. But that being said, I'm not a big drill guy. Day one to the end of the, end of the, end of the year, whether it's playoffs, bowl game, you don't do either. I'm doing the same. I, I'm, I'm taking drops. I'm taking, I'm doing things that apply to football, to, to a football game. And when I say taking drops, there is the, the the biggest factor besides the quarterback's confidence that he can have is he has got to have a routine, and his feet have to be his routine because I believe that your feet are you know, the or the, the three factors that, that that your feet have a, a critical impact in is your power, accuracy, and consistency, and you've got to have consistent footwork, and that's just a, an absolute. And I drill uh, taking drops every single day because there are certain fundamentals within those drops 
that allow you. It's kind of like a, I quit, equate it to like, uh, you know, when you played high school basketball, you went to the line. I'm quite sure you had a routine. You know, did you have a routine when you went to the free throw line and when you played basketball? Yeah, I can't say that it worked well for me, coach. But yes, I had a routine. <laughs> what was your routine? It was always to, to get up on the line. I think I put my right foot up first. I put my left foot up. I think I, I, you know, look at look at the rim, bounce it three times, and then bring it up and shoot. Exactly. My routine. I went to the line. I dribbled it three times. I spun the ball. I found the air hole made the shot well that's what your footwork can become for a quarterback it, it, it can help with your your confidence it, it, there's a comfort if you can develop consistency and have your feet in the proper place at all times so you know we work if I had a 15 minute individual period I'm spending 10 taking drops three step five step whether you're in the gun or underneath the center whatever I'm spending my time doing things that, that happen in a football game and I'm giving that guy the repetitiveness of feeling what it's supposed to feel like. And, and, and by giving him, you know, the fundamentals of, of when you hit the throw, you, you've got to have a wide base. Your weight has to be back for power. You've got to have a wide base. You go YouTube Brady, go YouTube Breeze, go uh, YouTube Manning, go YouTube Elway, any of the great ones. You're going to see guys sitting in the back, sitting in the pocket with a with a wide base mean what is a wide base shoulder width or wider because you do not want to overstride there's so many quarterbacks throughout football that whether it's high school junior high college pros you see it all over the place that take their drop and their feet you actually can hear their heels click sometimes their feet are so close together and what's getting ready to happen they're getting ready to overstride so you know instead of having the ball come out where it's supposed to at your release point, your arm can never catch up to, the, to your body because you've taken such a big stride. And that's why balls sail and go in the dirt and they're not nearly as consistent as they can be. So you know, I always taught that you should be able to, at your release point, you should be able to drive a rod from the palm of your hand to the tip of your chest, through the front of your kneecap, down to the ball of your foot. That's where the release point should be if your feet were right and if you've overstrided your arm is behind and that and that rod is now running down your back so your arm can never catch up and you're losing accuracy big time and consistency big time so all those things tie in you know so i want i wanted to have develop a tremendous i don't know i wanted to be the same over and over and over and, and, and develop a feel for what that thing is supposed to feel like when i hit at the top of my drop and then movements in the pocket and out of the pocket, and that's what I did, and that's all we did. I didn't run cones. I didn't. I didn't run. You know, run around dummies, jump over dummies, none of that stuff. You know, we we took drops and we did things that happened in a football game. Period. Yeah, I've I've seen that from the best. I had the opportunity to go out to the quarterback collective camp in L.A., and that camp is run by. NFL coaches. So, you know, Matt LaFleur's there, Mike Shanahan's there, Sean McVay's there, a bunch of, you know, coordinators, Rich Scangrello, quarterback coaches, all working with those kids. And, and the whole camp is based on basically five drills. And you hear all these guys, you know, I was sitting in Mike LaFleur's room and he's talking about what they do at the Niners. He's like, I run five drills. This is all I do. And really it was, it was everything that they did in camp. And so it wasn't a lot of you know, flashiness as far as what was happening, but there was a heck of a lot of coaching going on. Yeah, there's no flash and no fluff in what I do, and I believe that 100%. I believe the best guys out there are the guys that drill what happens in a game, and you've got to get – if guys aren't – you know, if their feet aren't right, you, you, you're losing power, accuracy, and consistency, and those are the things that, that, that you strive for, you know, throwing the football. So your footwork is everything. And, and, and you, you know, you want to develop a routine, just like going to that free throw line, man. It's got to be routine for them. And, and when they get out of routine, you've got to give them a way to get back to that, you know, wide base and weight back and all those other kind of things that you're looking for in order to allow them the opportunity to have power, accuracy, and consistency. Now you're going to, you know, Aaron Rodgers blows all this out of the water. He can do whatever the heck he wants to do and still complete passes. Brett Favre, you know, was the same way. But the vast majority of the great, truly great guys out there, man, their feet are superb. And Peyton Manning 
there's never been one better. You go study him. A Breeze, like I said, or Brady, they're all, all their feet. They look like clones. A Breeze is actually wider than than all of them. And the little guy, man, he has got a. I mean, he's got a huge base, but it allows him to be an a, an accurate thrower, and that's what you're looking for. Yeah, I, I you know a thing emphasized both in that camp and I can remember, man, he was a former player of mine back from when I started coaching ball when I was 19. He actually was a, a, a junior high player, Dave Ragone, who's the um, quarterbacks coach or might be the passing game coordinator now. I know he had a position change for the Chicago Bears, and I remember talking to him last year, and everything he's you know emphasizing with his quarterback is basically short stride or no stride right like the that wider base being able to rip that ball out really being you know not the stride really creating much momentum in the throw but the the core rotation the hips coming through all those kinds of things you know and, and a lot of things and I know when we teach these kids at the youngest level and and for some of them you know you, you need a little bit more of a stride with those little guys but you know the emphasis on not taking these big strides and I think probably too early on a lot of these guys get get coached to do that or it's or at the very least it's not coached out of them that's it it's not getting coached out of them that's what drives me crazy you see it all the way up all the way honestly to the pros and then i i 100 agree i mean you've got that the, those yeah the, the overstride that that's what kills you and you know little short four inch to to no to nothing is what you're looking for i agree 100 percent I mean, it was interesting to the point they were showing Baker Mayfield, and some of this is as we were watching, you know, film with these these you know quarterbacks from around the country, and you know, I think it was Rich Gangrilla pointed out, look, look at this. Not only is there no stride, as a negative stride. He actually stepped underneath himself to get you know that core rotation quick as he was was dropping in the pocket. So yeah, it's it's funny. Again, you you go back to a lot of this stuff. You know, internet is good and bad. We're able to sit here today and talk ball, you know, from across the country. Great thing. But then there's so many things that are unvetted that are put out there and look cool and go viral because of social media that aren't exactly helping us develop the game. No, it, yeah, that's why I said what I said earlier. It's, uh, in some ways, it's the most poorly coached position in football because there's so many people out there professing to know what they're talking about and they don't i mean you know, from a you know what we talked about earlier developing the relationship and the confidence and all that but really you know understanding what a guy what what it's like to be back there and understand exactly what all is happening uh, mentally and, and emotionally and on all that back there is just there's a lot of guys that, that, that looked the part that aren't and that's what drives me uh, the most crazy well, Coach, we'll get back into the development of the quarterback here. So we kind of focused on the footwork and the feet and all those kinds of things. What are you working on next, or what what aspect of it do you pay attention to next? Well, I think how you talk to them is is pretty critical. I mean, there's 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 certain things that you that you that you say and you don't say. And I think one of the things that you never should say to a quarterback is don't throw interceptions. You know that you're actually talking in negative terms. You know you're putting that thought in his head. But two, at some point you've got to turn a guy loose enough, and it's a very fine line. And the good ones, the great coaches, know where that line is. But there is a line in there. You you don't want a guy afraid to make a play because at some point in time in that game or that season to win all the marbles, he is going to have to make a throw to win a football game for you. And you don't want him so gun shy about not, you know, about throwing a pick that you're constantly, you know, that 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 you harp in it so much that 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 he's afraid to make a play. You you want a guy, you want to give a guy some rope and let him re- go out a little bit too far on that rope and reel him back in, as opposed to keep him on that short leash and never let him out because you're going to have a guy who's never going to live up to his potential and you're going to have a guy that's not going to make a play when you, when you need to, to make that play. So you got to give a guy some rope and then you got to be able to reel him back in a little bit as you, as you see fit. But if you're, you know, these guys that, 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 just, that hold the leash so tight, you know, there's, that's, that, that's as bad as almost as a guy that, you know, reckless and turn it over all the time because you've got to, you want to develop, that confidence in that guy that 
you know, I mean, the, what you know, you heard all the stories, Joe Namath, Elway, whoever, all the, you know, the, the guys that they believed in their arm, they believed they could make throws, and at some point in time, they got to have the confidence to cut it loose and make that throw. So, you know, I don't think you talk about in terms of, you know, never, you know, don't say never throwing interception. I don't, you know, never taking sacks. You know, honestly, there might be a time to take a sack. There might be a good time to take a sack, but boy, they're few and far between. I mean, you're you should be doing everything you can as as your as a quarterback coach to give your guy outlets, know where his checkdowns are at all times, know where he can get the ball thrown away in case the house caves in. There, yeah, when you're in the red zone and you got points on the board, yeah, you don't want to take a sack. All right, but there's not many times when, when a sack is good, you know, there's just, there's, there's, there, there's not many times when that happens. You, it, it's hidden yardage, it's first down, it's momentum, all those kinds of things happen when a sack occurs and you've got to do a great job of coaching your, your, your guy to not take sacks. And that's a lot of work. Yeah. A sack is good. Like I mentioned in the red zone, but as opposed to, you know, not turn the ball over, but well, there's not many of them. You want to try to avoid sacks at all costs. I think another development of your quarterback is teaching scramble to throw. So many guys run around and their eyes go down and their eyes, and their eyes aren't downfield. And instead of a 10 or 15 yard gain, which you love, we all love that as coaches, that 10, 15 yard move to sticks gain, man, you got a guy standing wide open 35 yards down the field that might have been a touchdown, but you know that's the closest thing when a quarterback scrambles to a punt return that there is in football. And you really want to teach him as a quarterback coach. Whenever you're teaching your movement stuff, you want to stand on the defensive side of the ball and watch his eyes, make sure his eyes are downfield and he's scrambling to throw and not scrambling to run. Always want to maintain your status as a passer. I'd always emphasize that to him. So critical in being able to you know, effective, make that scramble effective. A guy who's just running all the time, it's not going to work out well over the course of a game. No, it's not. It's absolutely not. I, another thing is I think you got to throw against the blitz every single day. All right? If you're not throwing against the blitz, I think you're – every day I think you're doing your team a disservice, your offensive team anyway. It's good for your quarterback. It's certainly good for your receivers because they know they can't sit around at the line of scrimmage and dance. It teaches them they got to get their butt up the field whether it's press or not, because, you know, those guys are coming and they don't have time to you to, to, to dance. It's good for the running backs, you know, their eyes, pickups, all those kinds of things. Certainly good for the old line, but you're doing your team a disservice if you don't throw against the blitz every day. I think you're doing your quarterback a disservice if you don't protect him inside out. With all these empty protections, you get five, you know, so many people are getting five out these days and getting an empty and, or free release in the back out of the backfield, and that's all great. I'm all for it. But so many times you see just clean run-throughs in the A-gap and B-gap. Man, that's how you get your quarterback hurt for for a long time. I believe you've got to commit, at least in my opinion, as a, as a, as a quarterback coach and coordinator to protect your quarterback inside out. So they're not going to get us from A to B. We're going to protect you from A-gap to B-gap. Now, you may have a C-gap come clean, but – we're not going to have someone come knock your teeth out, right? You know, in the, with a clean run right through the A gap or, or, or B gap. Another thing that I think that the guys could do a way better job of is teaching your quarterback to deceive with his eyes and his actions. You know, so many guys stare stare receivers down. It's a lost art, in my opinion, as quarterback coaches and quarterbacks of looking defenders off and given, you know, a, a slight shoulder faint, you know, like a curl flat, you know, you're trying to make the strong safety or whoever the flat defender is. You want to get the guy to drive the flat, you know, just give a little shoulder nod and get him to go, you know, just little eyes and actions of the quarterback is so could help these guys so much that I feel like that's kind of a, a lot lost art a little bit, a little bit. And, you know, depending on who your head coach and his, and, and his personality I think it's you've got to put your quarterback in adverse situations in practice. If you're not putting your guy in adverse situations in practice, you're not doing him any favors. You may be staying out of the doghouse with your head coach, which I know there's a lot of guys like that. You're just trying to stay one step ahead of the posse. But if you have an understanding head coach, you need to put that quarterback in some adverse situations every single day. 
whether you're making him pitch the ball on an option faster than he wants to or he's feeling heat on a, on a naked or a boot and right in his face when he wasn't ready or whatever the case might be, you've got to drill him in those situations daily to make him better. So when that does happen in a game, he has something he can go to and make a play. You know, I can't tell you how many times during the course of my career when I, you know, I do these practice in the quarterback's naked or boots or whatever and a guy in his face right now, I can't tell you how many times over the course of, of, of my career where it would show up one time a year invariably and the guy would, wouldn't be, he wouldn't panic. He would know exactly what to do. You know, he'd drop it down sidearm. He'd give a pump fake, but he had been in that situation enough to know what to do. And invariably that would happen at least once or twice a year where th- those situations pay off. You know, these NBA guys, that these NBA guys, those turn around, you know, 22 feet uh, turnaround jump, fall away jumpers don't just magically happen. You know, they're out there practicing, you know, and that's that's what you've got to have your quarterback do as well. Absolutely. Well, Coach, you know, looking at the situations, you talked about that, you know, knowing not when to not take a sack, et cetera, you know, all those things for I'm sure you have it very organized and, you know, the course of, you know, we, we were talking about a freshman, right? A freshman comes in and, hey, maybe he's got to play for you this year. I don't know. But what things uh, from, I guess, lack of better terms, kind of a checklist type of of thing do you have that we need to make sure we cover all these things so he understands that he knows what to do in these situations? Because, you know, I, I made this mistake as a young coach, right? You, you, you think, oh, well, I told him or he should have known that. There's too much to be assumed. You can't assume anything is – as you mentioned, like if you haven't worked it, you can't expect that guy to succeed with it. So what what things are you preparing in terms of making sure this guy has faced all the foreseeable things that might come up for him in the course of a game? I think that that's, that's a great question. I think your situation's in practice, and they're hard to do, especially on the high school level. Uh, you know, I've said this all for a long time, the last several years. Back when I was growing up, Football used to filter down. It went from the pros to college down to high school. Now I really believe that, that football is filtering up. I think a lot of the football you're seeing, starting to see now in the NFL and certainly college is coming from high school coaches because high school coaches know better than anybody how you have to adapt your personnel to what you do on offense. And so many of these guys in college and the pros and their egos and you know, by gosh, I'm a spread guy, or by gosh, I'm an air raid guy, or by gosh, I'm this, I'm that. And they're going to do that come hell or high water when that might, their personnel might not dictate that that's the very best thing for them. You know what I'm saying? So, you know, I think you've got to play to the strengths of your personnel. And the number one thing you've got to do is play to the strengths of your quarterback. And, uh, if you'll play the strengths of your quarterback, that's the number one priority. The next thing is you could play the strengths of your offensive line. What can they do? What what can they do? But number one, it's your quarterback. And there's a lot of things that that I think that go into that whole deal with the quarterback. But I think you've got to lose your ego as a quarterback coach. And all, what you've got to make that guy understand is throw completions. Throw completions. You throw completions, you're going to make first downs. You make first downs, you're going to put points on the board. But throw completions when you're throwing the football. That That is what your job is. There, there's never been a great quarterback who didn't have an ego. And there's never been a great quarterback or a good quarterback the first time you call smash that's not sitting back, back there and firing that corner out, you know, 22 yards on toward the end or toward the, the, the sideline. And whether it was there or not, they're going to show off that you know, that arm that they have, you've got to, you've got to coach that out. You've got, you've got to teach, you know, you, you've got to force those guys to, to understand that completions are the key. And in today's football, if you're not throwing for over 60, 65%, you're, you're honestly, you're, you're behind the curve big time. You really are in, in today's football. And so many guys, this is important to me as well. So many guys want to be so complicated and have so either do too much or have so much in 
for your quarterback to know that it's hard for him to do all that. You know, you signal in a, a big play. You, you know, he's got to get the signal. He's just got his head torn off by, you know, the big ugly defensive end over there outside back, or he just got his head ripped off. He's got to get the signal. He's got to communicate the signal. And then, you know, there's just a lot put on that guy's plate. And if you can help him any way you can by dumbing it down, and I don't mean that in a negative way, but, you know, instead of stuff being so difficult, hey, in our three-step game, you know, a lot of guys aren't throwing three-step anymore, and that's fine. They're replaced with RPOs. But I still believe there's a place for three-step because, you know, you can take put on one side a zone beater. Like I've got hitches over here to the left. You know, if I'm in whatever set, I've got hitches over here to the left, and I've got slant over here to my right. And whatever coverage they come out in, they can't be right. All, all You have to know what the coverage is, and your quarterback has to know. No one else has to know. So those freshmen and sophomore wide receivers can play. They don't. You're not asking them to read a coverage. The quarterback, all he has is one side of the field. All he has to know is it's single high, is it too high? You know, is it loose coverage, is it tight coverage? And, and let it rip. You can you can help him out by doing those kinds of things. Instead of having to look like the 49ers over there, if they're playing cover three, there's nothing wrong with curl flat. You know what I'm saying? We got 15 different ways to do this and do that. There's nothing wrong with throwing a curl and a flat or four verts or throwing a screen. But, but things that, that can give him an opportunity to be successful. And that's just, I've noticed that over the years. You know, you just, guys are doing so much stuff and at some point you've got to let that guy execute you got to let him because it, you can have all the fluffy stuff you want to have but if he's not executing it you're not you're not going anywhere so you know help him out give him you know in, in your three-step game give him man side and zone side give him loose side tight side in your drop back game give him you know a single high give him you know single high beaters to the right and cover two beaters to the left, and let, let him work aside and go on about your business. If it's covered, throw it away or run it. You know, come back and go again. But let a guy, you know, let a guy cut it loose mentally so he can so he can play. And he not, you know, get the chains off of him. Let him play. Well, Coach, to, to wrap things up here, and thank you for all the, the detail put here today, but for especially for uh, our guys, uh, younger QB coaches who are out there, you know, best advice for them to continue to learn the game and how to develop their quarterbacks moving forward. And I, I, I want to make sure you throw your book in there too. Well, well, I appreciate that. It's developing a championship quarterback and coaches' choice actually are the ones who published it and all that. But I believe there's I believe there's some good stuff in there. I'm not trying to sell a book. I'm just trying to there's some there's some good stuff in there. But the number one thing that I would tell those guys is have a relationship with your guy. Tell him the truth, no matter how difficult it is. Be honest. The, the best relationships that I have to this day, from 25 years ago, are guys I had to bench, are guys that weren't good enough to start, and they appreciated that honesty. But I, when I told them what was happening, I'm sure they felt my empathy and I felt bad, but this is what we're doing. And, you know, and that's, that's the best interest of the team. And I don't expect you to agree with it. And I don't, you know, I'm glad that you don't, but this is the direction we're moving. But those guys that I did that to stay in touch and are so appreciative to this day of, you know, being honest with them and shooting straight with them. So, I would tell them to, to, to develop those relationships. And number two, coach the heck out of fundamentals. All that other stuff is worth not much. It's worth not much. Those drills you're doing, I bet you eight percent of them are worthless. They don't. They don't. They don't translate to ball games. So they look pretty and they sell books and videos. And you know these quarterback trainers are getting rich on doing a lot of dumb stuff. But the things that win games are, you know, guys that are confident, guys that believe in what they're doing, know what they're doing, and have the correct mechanics and fundamentals to go win a game for you. Coach, again, I appreciate you taking the time. How can our listeners connect with you if they have any questions? I am uh, on Twitter at, at Coach John Bond. Gosh, 
I guess that's about all the social media I'm on, and I'm not on that that much. Yeah, I'm at Coach John Bond is my Twitter. Well, great. Well, Coach, again, appreciate all you've done for the game and how you're helping coaches out there still. And, you know, we'll we'll talk again soon here, maybe uh, after all this settles down. Okay. Hey, I appreciate you having me. I, I know these guys are about to want to jump off a bridge, not having – not getting to go work for 17 hours a day but um, this is a good thing that you're doing (laughs) thank you coach i appreciate it you take care all right thank you coaches again i want to remind you of what we're doing with the football development model please push this down to your youth coaches. I think this is a great way for you to get some organization and structure beyond what you've already done Uh, check it out all of our, our program development for youth football at fdm.usafootball.com. Again, check out our systems for blocking, tackling, and defeating blocks at footballdevelopment.com. If you register with your email, you get your choice of three free videos. There's some great things in there. I think things that as you get going again, you can get into the summer and maybe make up on some things that you might have lost if you had a spring ball, if you had time here in the spring to work on football. Some great drills for all those phases of contact. If you're enjoying the podcast, please have it over to iTunes or your platform and give us a five-star rate. If you have a minute, write a review. We really appreciate it, and we will read your review on our highlight show that we do at the end of the week. Thanks for listening to USA Football's Coach and Coordinator Podcast. For more resources, visit the Coach Performance Center at usafootball.com.